Uh, as promised, uh, we're now going to have a bit of an extension program, and so you guys have to put up with, with me here for a little while. And for you agents that are on that, that took the agent training that I gave here, I guess it was last week or the week before, you're going to see uh, a bit of familiarity here, but uh, uh, there's, a, there's an equation or two in here, so you guys might, and I saw Ambergy on here, you, you might need a second go at that anyway. So. Um, Let's let's. Uh, I want to go through and just give you a quick update, kind of on what's going to happen with the Cape Bull Call Share Program in 2021, and one of the impacts there is going to be on the accuracy values that's going to be required on bulls. And so I want to go through and kind of uh, share with you guys why accuracy is important. Okay, so let's see if I can get this thing moving. All right, so breeding objectives. I, I, I think that anytime we talk about selection, and that's what tonight's program is going to be about, is, is ultimately selection, we need to think about breeding objectives. Because if we're going to try and make change to our cattle herd, we need to have a plan on what we want that change to be. And that's what a breeding objective is. These are specific genetically influenced objectives that are going to help us to achieve our overall farm goals. Okay, so when we think about a breeding objective, I think you should keep these things in mind. It needs to be something that's going to have an economic impact on your herd, or it's going to improve the well-being of the cattle, or it provides some convenience to you and your operation or even some social aspects. And when, and when I talk about things like social aspects, uh, think about things like uh, genetically dehorning our cattle as opposed to doing it with, with dehorners. That both has a well being and really some social aspects to it. So uh, when we talk about breeding objectives, it, it, can, it just needs to fit some important criteria for why it is you're in the cattle business. And a breeding objective also needs to, we can't just think about the genetics part of it because we think need to think about a little bit broader than that. Because we have to think about the market that we're gonna be putting those cattle into. Uh, we had a conversation today with some of our KBN guys and, and thinking about the new budget and, and the marketing is, is one of the big issues that's out there right now. Uh, is how are we gonna get our cattle? I mean, it, it's these crazy times have shown us that that just uh, having a demand and having a supply is, is not all there is to it. There's a whole lot in between uh, that due to this COVID issue uh, has been messed up. And so uh, cattlemen are getting way lower prices and consumers are having to pay way higher for those for the beef. So uh, something's not happening right. And so uh, surely there could be some potential out there to look at different marketing opportunities as well. Also, how we manage the cattle is going to play an impact, impact on that breeding objective and some of our environmental factors. The, the big one we deal with here in Kentucky, of course, is the fescue toxicosis and also just the fluctuations and environmental change that we have to deal with uh, going basically from flood to drought and, and back again within a series of three weeks. Uh, as much rain as we've had already uh, this year, I walked through my pasture this afternoon and there's cracks in the ground now. So now I'm in some pretty clay country, but uh, but that's what we deal with. So what genetics tools do we have available? You guys know I can't give a talk without at least giving a shout out to crossbreeding. Uh, crossbreeding is always gonna play an impact in what we need to be thinking about from a genetic uh, standpoint, but selection is where our target is gonna be tonight. And when we talk about selection, uh, some things that we need to consider is when we deal with selection, what we're trying to do is make genetic change also need to always think about targeting traits that have economic importance to us. I, I like to use the term, uh, think about traits that either put money in your pocket or take money out of your pocket. Those are the traits that we need to be targeting our selection for. And we also need to remember that, that we need to select for more than one trait at a time. If we get over uh, zealous, let's say, about something like calving ease, and, and we select extremely hard for calving ease and ignore other things, then we all know that what we do is we compromise growth and some of the other important traits uh, that we deal with. So we need to be thinking about multiple traits at the same time. Now tonight, like I said, we're, we're going to focus more on the, on the uh, other aspects of it, um, just on the selection part of, of this tonight. 
So what should you be selecting for? Uh, well, are, are you wanting to increase? Are you wanting to decrease? Uh, those are, we, we always kind of go back to the bell-shaped curve when we talk about biolo biological factors. And most of what we deal with in the cattle industry fits very well on this bell-shaped curve. Uh, and basically, this is your population of cattle. Uh, and you have a big group here right in the middle that are close to average. You have some that are underperformers down here and some that are overperformers. And so, uh, or high performers. So what we need to, to think about is if you need to make improvements to that trait, then we need to be selecting these animals that's over on this end of the bell-shaped curve. Let's say it's a trait that we want to pull back on, and, and I'll give a good example. Some people, in, some producers in Kentucky have put too much milk in their herd for the resources that they have. So if you feel you need to back off on milk, then this is the side of the bell-shaped curve that you select for there. But you know what? This is the area that probably gets ignored the most and shouldn't be, because what do we need to do if we need to stay where we are? These are the animals, the average animals, and see, that's just it. Nobody wants to choose or select average animals. But if you're in the right place from a production standpoint for the resources you have, these are the animals that you need to be selecting. So let's keep this in mind, depending on what trait we're talking about, uh, where on the bell-shaped curve we need to be thinking about selecting from. All right, here we go. Here, here goes the, the, the big equation. Now, don't get too concerned about it because we're going to focus on one area. We're going to move the equation, but uh, we're going to focus on one area. Because let's think about the situation. In most cases, we feel like for a particular trait, we need to make some genetic change. And so what is going to impact that change? One thing, and I'll explain all of these, is intensity of selection that we have. We're going to look at the accuracy of the selection. That's going to have an impact. And we're going to look at the additive genetic variance. Now, let's remember, these are all on the numerator side of the equation. That means the larger these numbers are, the more genetic change we have. All right, let's remember that. The numerator, the, the larger the number, the more genetic change we have. The only thing in the denominator is genetic or generation interval. And so with this one, as it gets higher, genetic change decreases. So in, in terms of wanting to make rapid genetic change, we would want to think about lowering that denominator, okay? All right, so back to that normal distribution and, and just to remind you guys of kind of how it works and, and uh, for those of you guys and, and Dr. Coffey and I are on about, we're, we're similar age and, and went through school at similar times and he remembers the 80s and was a judger and that's what we dealt with back in the, the 80s on the judging team. Uh, my, my livestock judging coach's motto was, is when in doubt, frame them out. And you could just about do that. You could go through and you could pick the very biggest uh, animals, uh, it, particularly when we were dealing with beef cattle, uh, the taller they were, the, the better they were considered. Uh, we came to that point really because back in the late 50s and 60s, this is what we were dealing with. Now, you didn't see this type of cattle very much actually out on the farms, uh, but in the show ring, that's what was dominating uh, back earlier on. And there's a picture of me with my grand champion steer in 1972. And I understand for today's standards, he wasn't moderate, but that's a pretty moderate steer, I'm gonna say from a frame standpoint. So, uh, so that's kind of how the bell-shaped curve works. And I, I think everybody probably understands that. All right, so with our, uh, what we're gonna try and do or, or go through the components of this genetic change, let's start with intensity of selection. So when we deal with intensity of selection, this has to do with how much of the population we choose. If we're always gonna be choosing on this upper end, it's how intensive that selection is. Because I think everybody can see that if you have, if you select fewer animals of the very top animals, there's more spread between the average and those desirable animals than if you selected a higher percentage of those animals, okay? So think about this, what's the, the shaded area 
the average value for that is going to be lower or closer to the average than the average value of these animals. Okay, so of course, if you're wanting to intensify selection, uh, you keep back fewer animals every year and, and just select those very elite ones. Okay. Now, is that practical? Not always, and I'm going to show you in a minute how it kind of messes up this uh, this whole genetic change equation uh, anyway in, in, in the end. So less intense means you keep back more of them, more intense means you keep back fewer of them. From a practical standpoint to you guys, when you're what you're trying to do in your herds, if you're trying to make rapid genetic change, then you're going to buy bulls that are in the top top percent of the breed for whatever trait you're talking about. Okay, you've all heard me talk about these EPV percentile tables. Uh, so if it's a trait you're interested in, let's say you're wanting to kind of improve the weaning weight of your herd. If you go and buy a top percent weaning weight bull, then you're going to make more rapid genetic change, of course, than if you were to pick a bull towards the middle. Makes perfect common sense and that's exactly how it works. On the female side, then it depends, uh, then you would want to retain your superior heifers and try and reduce your inferior cows. Now what it takes to be able to do this though, folks, is records. And that's the area that most of us uh, in the cattle industry get a little squeamish when we start talking about records. Uh, but if you have good records, that's how you make rap more rapid genetic change by keeping back the better females, the young females, and replacing those older cows that aren't getting the job done. All right, I skipped one because we're going to focus on this one. So I'm going to come back to it in a second. So now we have that funny looking character there, and that is additive genetic variance. Here's the good news, folks. Don't worry about it at all because you can't do a thing about that. We can change all of these other factors uh, through our management. We can't do anything with that. That's basically what her where heritability comes from. If we have greater genetic variance, that's usually the more highly heritable traits, okay? And you can't change heritability, so don't worry about that one. Generation interval, okay? It's the amount of time that is required to place, replace one generation with the next generation. And an easy way to kind of think about that is the approximate average age of the breeding females or males in your herd. So if you just look at the females in your herd and kind of figure out what the average age is, and now here's going to be the difference, right? If you have had a slow selection or you only keep back a few females every year and you primarily keep your older, more productive animals and only keep back a few heifers every year, you're going to have a fairly old average cow herd and you're not probably making a lot of rapid progress. Whereas if you're turning over 20% of your herd every year, uh, you may be, particularly if you're doing it based off of records, you might be making fairly rapid uh, genetic change. Because here's the deal, guys. This is why we can't get too caught up with it. This is another thing that, that really and truly gets taken out of our hands. Because if you think about it, the more intensive our selection is, so the, the more intensive the selection pressure that we put on, that's actually going to cause generation interval to go up. Okay, uh, and, and so it's going to increase the average age of the cows. And so because we're keeping back fewer young ones and the better fewer. Uh, and so we actually increase the average age. And so they actually counterbalance each other. Think about it this way. If we have a, if our replacement rate is 15 percent. All right, so that means we have 15% young animals, but that means we have 85% older animals, okay? So if we increase our intensity of selection and go to 10%, yes, we've improved intensity of selection, but now we have just a few young animals and even more older animals. So now we have gone the wrong direction on uh, generation interval. So that's where they kind of uh, contrast each other and makes it hard to make a whole lot of change there. So it really leaves this, uh, let me go through strategy here real quick. So for seed stock guys, if 
the seed stock guys are generally the ones that are really pushing for the shorter generation interval because they're trying to make rapid change and change the breeding population that's available out there. And so they can do that uh, through a more intensive selection pressure uh, or it, with a shortened generation interval, I'm sorry. Uh, they can, it, you can also do that, a good way to shorten your generation interval too is to use the top AI bulls. Uh, that helps to shorten generation interval and increase intensity of selection at the same time. For a commercial guy though, let's think about a commercial guy. I, we want to kind of uh, lengthen the generation interval there, right? Because our cows are most productive between five and 10 years of age. So we want to keep as many of those five to 10 year old cows in the herd as possible to maximize production. So, so it's a little bit of a strategy thing there depending on whether you're a seed stock guy or you're a purebred or a, a commercial guy. So we're going to fall back to that one we skipped over, and that's accuracy, because that's the one that we can actually do something about, particularly in our bull buying. Okay, so that's accuracy of selection. So when we think about accuracy of selection, here, here once again is our bell-shaped curve, and these are the EPDs of potential animals that we can be selecting. Okay, and from the very, for the particular trait we're interested in, the very good animals for that trait to the not so good animals for that trait. Okay, let's assume we have the fictitious situation where we can have that all of these are pure true EPDs, that they are accurate, 100% accurate EPDs. They are the true genetic merit of the bulls represented here. So let's say that we want to pick then the best bulls in that group. So we draw the line, our, our line of, of selection. And so all the bulls to the right of that line are the ones that we're choosing, okay? So those are the ones that we pick. If, they, if those are truly the best animals that we have available to pick, we're gonna make rapid genetic change, right? Because they're the superior animal, these are the inferior animals that we're gonna be calling, so we're gonna make rapid genetic change, okay? So let's move though to a more realistic situation and let's say accuracy is only 50%. Let's say we draw the same line of selection, we're still gonna, pick the same group, right? Because based on the information we have, based on the EPDs that are available to us, these are the best bulls from a genetic standpoint that we have available to us. The problem is, is that when we look at the actual breeding values of those bulls, these bulls actually should have been on this side of the line. So we got them wrong. The EPDs were incorrect. They were the best estimate we had of what the genetic merit of those bulls are, but we just flat got it wrong. I think we've all done that before. We've bought what we thought was an easy calving bull and had to pull some calves and, and so forth. So it does happen. Conversely, there were some of these animals that we did not select that actually had better genetic merit than we thought and actually should have been on this side of the selection line. So we shouldn't have chosen these, we should have chosen these, and so therefore we didn't make as rapid a genetic progress as, as, uh, as we could have. That's how accuracy impacts us. It influ negatively influences our ability to make genetic progress. Okay, so let's get to what we can do then about accuracy. In the seed stock industry, and we, where we have accuracy is on the EPDs, and so we have EPDs on seed stock animals. We don't have it on our commercial animals. We have, them on, have EPDs for our seed stock animals. Those EPDs are based on these bits of information or the accuracy value. The more data we have, or phenotypic records, those are the actual weights, uh, the, the weaning weights, the, the, the calving ease scores, the cr scrotal circumference, conference measurements, all of those are the phenotypic records that hopefully our seed stock producers are collecting and sending to their breed associations for, for, to put into the genetic evaluation. There are also some things that can be done with contemporary grouping strategies, and those are some things that seed stock, your seed stock guy knows and, and, can, uh, and can appropriately apply that strategy to improve the accuracy of the bulls as well. 
But the big one in more recent years is the genomics. We can now do genomics testing on our cattle uh, that has a big impact uh, on accuracy. And the reason it does is it basically improves the pedigree, and I'm gonna show you how that works here in just a second. And it also, and, and basically uh, it's the equivalent of, of Sorry guys, I have a gaming headset and if no one talks to me for 15 minutes, it shuts off. But I, at least I finally figured that out. All right, so uh, I'm gonna go over a table as well that's gonna show you the pro progeny equivalence of when we have a genomics test done on a bull. And, and to me, that's the big selling point for getting this done. All right, so how, do, how does genomics testing improve the pedigree? Uh, this is actually me and my family. I'm not gonna ask, since you guys can't talk, you, you, you can't choose which one's me. I'm gonna give you a hint. It's the good looking kid there. But that's me and my four brothers. And that's actually, I was the middle, middle boy. So what does genomics do? It first gives us accurate parentage. And it also improves what we call the relationships. And I'll show you what I mean about that here in, in just a second, okay? So as a, as a geneticist, when they came out with genomics testing for people, I decided that I wanted to have a, a genomics test. Actually, my father was the first. Uh, I had an aunt that's really into genealogy, and she wanted my dad to get tested to maybe help locate some, some distant relatives and all to, uh, for, for tracing our family tree. And so my dad got the genomics test. About two years later, I decided to get the genomics test and I got it. And about a year later, my son uh, decided that he was gonna get his genomics test. He asked for that for his birthday. And so all three of us got the genomics test done. And there was a neat tool that I'm gonna show you on the next page uh, that, that kind of explains that, how the, how the uh, pedigree gets improved uh, through genomics. But I wanna relate this, cause this has to do with that parentage thing I talked to you about before. Cause here's the thing about genomics testing is that you don't fill out a big form that tells them who all you're related to you basically spit in a test tube, send it to them, and they send back and tell you who you're actually related to. And I had never thought about that before that uh, when I looked at these results that it may be something different than I was anticipating. So as I pulled up this page and I, I looked and I saw that it said that uh, my dad was actually my dad, um, I actually, had had one of those really aha moments of thank goodness uh, that's how the test came out and I, I celebrated for about a half of a second and then i thought real quickly well i better check and make sure my son is my son and there you go thank goodness he was and is uh, and my daughter has now been tested and she's mine too so uh that's how I'm gonna tell you guys that not everybody finds the results they were anticipating on this. Same thing with bulls. Uh, even though Dr. Anderson tells you that he is 100% sure that he drew the right straw out of the tank, uh, research has shown that about 15% of the time we get parentage wrong uh, in the pedigree. And so uh, mistakes do happen. This is kind of what I wanted to show you guys though, because this is a tool that, that shows actually, uh, when you look at the relationship between me and my father and between my son and my father, where each of us got our genetics from my dad. So you'll notice that orange bar, that's the genetics that I got from my dad on each chromosome. And you'll notice that I got a full chromosomes worth of genetic information from my dad. And I will tell you guys, it happens that way every single time. That's how genetics work. You got half of your genetics from your father and half of your genetics from your mother, a full chromosomes worth of information from each of them. Okay, so 23 uh, chromosomes worth of DNA from each parent to give you 23 pairs, okay? That's how it works from, from parent to offspring. But the one that most people don't understand is that when you go that next generation, I think all of you realize that in theory, you have 25% of the same genetics as each of your grandparents. That is on average. 
you theoretically could have as much as 50% of the genetics from one grandparent. If you do, say if it was my father that my son had 50% of his genetics, that would mean he had none of the genetics from my mother that would have got passed down to him. Now, does that ever happen? Probably not, or, or that one in a gazillion ch chances. So here's where it, it shows you though. You can see if you look here, my son for chromosome 12 got a full chromosomes worth of DNA material from my father. That means for chromosome 12, my mother contributed zero DNA to my son. Now, she doesn't need to be too angry because if you look on four and five, my son got zero DNA from my dad from chromosome four and five. So that means he would have gotten all of the, the full chromosome worth of DNA material from both chromosome four and five from my mother. And so even though the expectation is, is that he got 25% of each from each of those grandparents, uh, the numbers don't always come out that way. And I can show you that way in, in, uh, in, in actually in, uh, in cattle as well. Uh, my friend Steve Miller at the American Angus Association uh, did a little project uh, where he wanted to look at, at some relationships. So he looked at six bulls that were full sibs, all right? So all six of these bulls were complete full sibs with each other. Now, I think everybody knows that our expectation of full sibs is that their relationship is about 50%, that you share 50% in common with your full sibling, okay? And, and, but I think what we don't always realize is, is that that is just an average. It could theoretically, and think about this, think about an identical twin. That's not the relationship, is it? With an identical twin, that's a 1.00. Okay, and theoretically, you could go the other extreme and you could have zero relationship with a, with actually your full sib. Uh, it can happen that way. Okay, and so now it, it doesn't and won't, but it could. But the expectation is on average that you share 50% gen genetics in common. Now, with these six bulls, there was some inbreeding. And so based on inbreeding, it was calculated that their true relationship should have been on average 0.59% or 59%, okay? When they looked at all the pairings of those full sibs, they found that two of the full sibs, two of the brothers were actually, uh, had a relationship of, of actually slightly less than the 0.5. Uh, but, but a full 10% less than what we would have expected the average to be. And there was one pair of those brothers that actually was 6% uh, above uh, the expectation. So on average, they probably hit pretty close to that 0.59, but you can see in actuality, uh, there was a fair bit of difference in how closely related those full sibs were. And when you're getting to precision of, of, of genetic evaluations like we're to today, that makes a big difference in how accurately you can predict uh, the performance of, of one bull versus another. And this is where the, the rubber hits the road, to be quite honest. And this is what we call our progeny equivalence tables. Uh, this is for the Angus breed on the left. Uh, and this is the IGS group. That's the Simmental, Gelby, Red Angus, a, a group of, of other breeds uh, that have formed a coalition. Uh, and this is just showing if you do a genomics test and nothing else, it's the same for calving ease within Angus as if that bull were to have produced 24 calves and the records were sent in and gone through the genetic evaluation. So instead at birth, you could take that hair sample and send it in and it's the same as waiting until that bull bred 24 cows and had 24 calves uh, that you collect the record zone. So that's a considerable amount of information that we can get a, a, a whole lot earlier and, and help us with our predictions on these yearling bulls early in life. For other traits, let's think about a trait uh, like stayability, which is a reproductive trait. Look at that. Instead of waiting for 10 years until the bull is long dead, we can, a hair sample will tell us the equivalent of that bull had raised 25 of his daughters up to maturity to know how long they were going to stay in the herd. That, that's an incredible that we can get that amount of data to help us out with an important trait like stability. And so if nothing else impresses you, I hope these tables impress you 
in terms of how much data we get from just that one little hair sample or blood droplet that, that you send into the Breed Association uh, to get that genomics test on those bulls. So genomically enhanced EPDs, what they do is they improve accuracy, which basically lowers your risk of making a mistake. It benefits both the seed stock guy and the commercial guy. I can't overemphasize that. So you seed stock guys, you're the one that has to foot the bill and get it done, uh, but it's gonna greatly enhance your ability to make selections. It's also gonna make a more reliable product to your customers. And, and I think will improve your overall return or repeat customers because they got what they were expecting to get uh, when they bought that bull from you. It's about $37 now to have that genomic test done uh, and, and sent in to the association. Uh, can that be recuperated? You know what? I, I really think that it can. And particularly when I'm gonna show you the impact that it's gonna have on the CAKE program, uh, I, I really do think that that, that is a value that, that our commercial guys need to be willing to pay that extra money uh, if they can get a genomically tested bull. Uh, and I think it has a uh, return on investment. So in 2021, here's, here's what's gonna happen. A bull is either going to have to be genomically tested or he's going to have an accuracy value of, of 0 0.30 or above for the calving ease direct EPD, okay? So those are the criteria you need to be looking for. In most cases, guys, this is gonna be what you're gonna look for is a genomically tested bull. Now, where we came up with this figure is I talked to the breed associations and they said that if you have a bull genomically tested, it should always put its calving ease direct EPD above a 0.30. So you don't have to go actually look and see and make sure and get verification that he was genomically tested. If he's got an accuracy value of a 0.30, you can be pretty well assured that he has been genomically tested. So that's why we did this as an ease thing to keep you from having to track down and prove that he was genomically tested. If the accuracy value is 0.3 or above for the calving ease direct, you're good to go as long as he meets the other qualifications uh, of the CAKE program. So that's gonna be a big change and, and we're trying to get the word out there to everybody because um, we don't want people coming and, and buying a, a low accuracy bull and trying to get call share and being turned away. So, uh, and, and you don't need to do it after the fact, folks. Don't buy the bull, then send in to get the genomics test because I'm telling you right now, based on experience with many breeders, those values can and do change and they don't always change to the better. Uh, so you could go from a bull that's an easy calving ease qualifier for the heifer acceptable program, uh, get him genomically tested and he may come back undervalued. So uh, be careful and, and don't get yourself into trouble. Take home message and then I'm gonna quit and see if we have any questions. Uh, accuracy in bull selections does have value. I hope that I showed you tonight that it does have some value. Uh, it's a risk management tool uh, and it also can improve your, your rate of change uh, in your herd. Uh, also, the other take home message is just remember that genomics testing is gonna be required for 2021. So you need to either make sure that you can prove that he's been genomically tested or has that higher accuracy value in order to get cost share dollars. And with that, I'm gonna wrap it up. I'm just gonna put that slide up there uh, just for you guys to, to see what the code is for your uh, CAPE educational programs. If you want to fill that out under the speaker signature, you can put that code in and it should work as long as you get a verification from your county agent. Uh, the YouTube video from last week is up on the, on the herd health topic. Uh, and I'll be sending that out as well in an email tomorrow along with the full schedule of the remaining talks that we have on the program. Uh, next week we have uh, the, our repro guys. We have uh, Dr. Anderson is gonna te team with our researcher and, and uh, one of our instructors, Dr. Philip Bridges, and they're gonna talk about the impact of selenium on beef cattle fertility. Uh, that's a lot of the work that Dr. Bridges is, is doing down at the Princeton station. All right, so I'm gonna close and I'm gonna try and pull this up and see if we have some chats or if we see if we have any questions, if I can find that.
Well, so there we go. There it popped up. Um, I just needed to point out there that I never make a mistake pulling straws out. <laughs> I figured for, I should have been able to. I should have been able to get a, a, a something out of you there. Except for, of course, the case in northern Kentucky. Ah, yeah, we we already know of one uh, well-known case of that, right? <laughs> yeah. Do you see Charles's uh, question? I do, and Charles was trying to get me in trouble, uh, trying to, to pick favorites here. And uh, I, Charles, I, I, this, this sounds like a political answer, but it's really not. Uh, what, what you want to do with your breeding program is dictated by many, many factors that, that, um, that have to go into play. Uh, the big things, like I had mentioned earlier, is, is what your market is and, and what your management is. Depending on those two factors, uh, how I would rank bulls, a, a group of five bulls could, may flip flop completely upside down, uh, depending on what you're, how you're going to sell them and, and what kind of management you're going to put them in. So it, it's one of those things that really takes a lot more uh, in-depth uh, thought process to, to figure out what the true needs are for, for any particular operation and then make a targeted selection based on that. I know I danced, but that's uh, that's really my honest opinion on that question. Any other questions? Uh, don't forget, if you have any other questions uh, for Dr. Coffey, uh, I'm sure he's he's still on here too and be happy to, to answer them as well. All right, guys, uh, I'm not going to keep you around and, unless you all have some questions. And I know uh, if anybody's frantically typing, I apologize. But um, uh, seeing no further questions come across chat, we're going to uh, wrap this thing up. Uh, thanks again to Dr. Coffey for coming and giving us uh, the State of the Department address. And I can promise you we're going to make it through. Uh, we, we always do. But um, uh, and, and I, I think I think on the beef side, I'm I'm even hopeful that we're gonna we're gonna do it actually uh, in a very uh, uh, aggressive way. How's that? 